Bom, é, nosso título é How Top-Down Predictions Modulate Perception. É, eu sou professora aqui da Unicinos, para quem não me conhece, sou organizadora também desse evento, Sofia Stein, e o Ricardo é mestre pelo PPG Fio da Unicinos, né? e tem trabalhado comigo já há cinco anos, pelo menos, talvez seis, é, desde a graduação, e ajudou a montar o Laboratório de Filosofia Experimental e Ciências, é, Ciências da Cognição aqui na Unicinos. É, nós, vamos, nós hoje vamos fazer algo relativamente simples, nós vamos, eu vou fazer uma introdução mais filosófica sobre, na verdade, um pouco como que nós chegamos a alguns problemas filosóficos que nós achamos que podiam ser resolvidos via ciência cognitiva, de forma bastante simples, e depois o Ricardo vai apresentar alguns resultados que ele também apresentou na, te, na, na dissertação dele de mestrado, das medições que nós fizemos, com as quais nós achamos que nós conseguimos não responder propriamente aos problemas filosóficos, mas avançar na solução de alguns problemas filosóficos. É, ok. So, some people say that we are in the central century of brain uh, uh, research, uh, and that we will discover this century how our brain works. It's fantastic. So, uh, we presuppose in our research group that we are animals and we are determined biologically by evolution. So that's one of our main presuppositions. So I don't presuppose that uh, we need any law besides scientific laws to explain our brain and to explain our experiences. I also presuppose, and we presuppose, that as philosophers we can do empirical research. So uh, we can join multidisciplinary groups of research and help solving also philosophy, philosophical problems in these groups through empirical research. So we presuppose that we are doing a naturalized philosophy uh, besides other, other, sci other sciences as psychology, linguistics, uh, artificial intelligence, neuroscience, and anthropology. These were the main science besides philosophy when uh, cognitive sciences started in the 80s, the, the cognitive science as we know nowadays. Uh, as we have been seeing uh, this uh, since yesterday and since last week, and Barry has uh, uh, talked uh, a lot already about um, some of the issues cognitive science uh, are uh, worried about, uh, cognitive science are, have some main uh, themes and issues like attention, how we process languages, how we learn, how we uh, develop as human beings, how our memory work, and how perceptions are linked to actions, for example. And when all this is uh, uh, are issues to, for research, we have some questions that arise in cognitive sciences, and there are philosophical questions. Just to do some examples, to give some examples. Can the mind be replicated? Can we know when we are in a state of knowing and when we are 
or when we are eluded or deceived, these old philosophical questions, are we both with the, uh, uh, are we born with the capacity of learning a complex language, language, or do we learn syntax and semantics socially, imitating? How do we memorize that what we perceive and experience of the world, how much in which intensity and with which grade of radicality. Our perception of objects and facts depends on our intentions, depends on what we are doing or intend to do, depends on our previously memorized concepts or informations, so, besides reasoning, besides a priori deductions, we have nowadays at our disposal other methods, empirical methods, behavioral experiments where we can see reactions with measured time, physiological respo responses, we can do eye tracking, we can measure brain signals, Images, an EEG, fMRI, or other uh, instruments. We can uh, design computational models, very complex computational models. And we have other neurobiological methods as recording one neuron, the right, direct, direct brain stimulation, etc. So, but again, <laughs> which are, are, are our philosophical problems? So, one of my main problems is linked to a, a classic discussion uh, called the discussion about the myth of the giving. I am an empiricist and a kind of positive positivist, if you want, and uh, Wilfried Sellers is famous to explain uh, in a very uh, clear, maybe clear way, what's the myth of the given. So the, the question is, do we perceive first of all sense data that are not modified by previous knowledge, are really sense data the substract of all or our knowledge or not? Or are they a kind of uh, a product of previous knowledge? There is a famous example of, of Sellers in Empiricism and the Philosophy of Mind from 1956. Uh, and I will read this uh, part, this paragraph, because it's it's very nice paragraph where Sellers gives an, an, um, a kind of uh, thought experiment. And I think Many of what we are doing as researchers uh, is trying to answer to this uh, thought experiment. Uh, so Seller says, to bring out the essential feature of the use of the word looks, I shall engage in a little historical fiction. A young man no whom I shall call John, works in a necktie shop. She, he has learned the use of color words and the us, in the usual way, with this ex exception. I shall suppose that he has never looked at an object in a, other than standard conditions, like sunlight. As he examines, he stock every evening before closing up shop. He says, this tie is red, 
this is green, this is purple, etc. And such of his linguistic peers as happen to be present nod their heads approvingly. Yes, you are right, they say. Let's us suppose, let's us suppose now that at this point in the story, electrical lighting is invented. His friends and neighbors rapidly adopt this new means of illumination and wrestle with the problems it presents. John, however, is the last to succumb. Just after it has been installed in his shop, one of his neighbors, Jim, comes in to buy a necktie. Here is a hands of green one, says John. But it isn't green, says Jim. Um, and takes John outside. Well, says John, it was green in there, in the shop, but now it's blue uh, in sun, uh, sunlight. No, says Jim, you know that neckties don't change their colors merely as a result of being taken from one place to the other. But perhaps electricity changes their color and they change back again in daylight. That would be a queer kind of change, wouldn't it, says Jim. I suppose so, says bewildered John, but we saw that it was green in there. No, we didn't see that it was green in there, because it wasn't green, and you can see that it isn't so. Well, this is a pretty prickle, says John. I just don't know what to say. The next time John picks up this tie in his shop and someone asks what color it is, his first impulse is to say, it's green. He suppresses the impulse and remember what happened before, comes out with, it's blue. What he does not see that's blue, but would, nor would he say, that he sees it to be blue. What does he see? Let us ask him. I don't know what to say, says John. If I didn't know that the tie is blue and the alternative to granting this is odd indeed, I would swear that I was seeing a green tie and seeing that it's, it's green. It is as though I were seeing the necktie to be green. <laughs> so, colors, perception of colors, conceptual penetration of perception of colors. Is the necktie green? Or is it blue? Or do we see it green under electric lightning and correct our judgment saying that it is in reality blue? Is it possible to correct internally what we see or so as to at the end see it differently? Would it be an automatic, non-conscious process, conceptual or not, or a conscious, conceptual process? These questions can be uh, put when we are trying, when we are experimenting all these questions. A second philosophical problem very old indeed. How do we build a unique concept or proxy type representation according to prints out of different perceptual instances, but also similar ones in some aspects, seen from different angles and under different lightning? 
lightings, so that we are able to use it again, this representation, to identify new objects. What Prince and others says, so what we do is we use working memory, previously built, uh, we use the working memory when we are re-identifying objects with what we have built inside. And this working memory uses previously built general representations or concepts stored in the long-term memory to identify new percepts. So, if we need conceptual mediation so as to identify both specific properties of objects and also objects of a certain type, it seems that we shouldn't presuppose modular primary percepts. Uh, what I'm saying is, if we really, every, every instance of identification of or re-identification of ob objects are using previous, previous built representations that are built and are memorized in long-term memory but are used in working memory, then we it's difficult to say that really we have percepts, uh, kind of uh, per perception results that are just primary modular percepts. Okay, so we can uh, uh, explain that afterwards, but if it's that all is true, then we have always a kind of uh, top-down penetration, conceptual penetration in perception. Well, good afternoon. I will continue the talk, uh, especially with uh, in Wilfred Seller's line, his question, do we perceive first of all sense data that are not modified by previous knowledge? And I will argue that previous knowledge do influence perception. And uh, I will show some new evidences that uh, corroborate this claim, this claim. But first, I need to present uh, an opposite claim, especially from Jerry Fodder's modularity of mind. For him, knowledge has no interference, is not influencing perception, uh, because for, for him, perceptual systems, input systems, are modular. And I will first, I will first uh, define what is a module. And Jesse Prince summarizes uh, the main features of a module. For him, modules for further, they are localized, they are subject to characteristic breakdowns, they are mandatory, they process uh, the inputs in an automatic way, not in a controlled one. They are fast, they are shallow, the, the outputs are sometimes very simple and go against or after judgment, later judgment. They are ontogenetically determined. They are domain specific. This is the main feature of a module. What individuates a module is this feature being domain specific that means that modules uh, restrict the class of inputs that they process. For example, if we have a module for face detection, this module only takes as inputs faces and not other things. They are inaccessible. Higher levels uh, don't have access to the computations that a, model, a module executes only the conclusion, the output. And at the other side of being inaccessible, 
they are informationally encapsulated. They cannot be guided by information at higher levels of processing. That is, a module process its inputs using information within the system. It cannot have access to information of other levels for higher order, le higher level, higher levels. And uh, those features are not randomly co-occurring in a module. There are some connections. For example, modules are fast because they are informationally encapsulated, because they restrict information that they can consult. They will be fast. Uh, I think perception is not modular uh, because of this property number nine that consider them as encapsulated. The opposite of encapsulation is cognitive penetrability. That means that uh, a system is cognitively penetrable if it has access to information from other systems, especially global processes like the organism beliefs, desires, and other things like that. So the argument is that if perception is modular, then it is informationally encapsulated. And if it is informationally encapsulated, then it is cognitively impenetrable. So this image show, shows uh, normally what a modularist that considers inputs processing in a bottom-up fashion, that we first receive the input, the perceptual system being modular processes it with no access to higher levels, and then it gives to the higher levels its output. But uh, it's perception penetrable. Using this bottom-up schema, uh, we, have a, we see a problem that in this second image, because it goes against our basic notion of causality, saying that we receive an input, and uh, when we process it, 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 uh, it has access to uh, a process that we will only have access after. But another possibility, using the recent framework called predictive processing of Bayesian brain, predictive mind, is that perhaps we should talk about this other order of uh, stimulus processing. Predictive coding considers that the brain is basically a, a predi uh, is, is in the business of prediction, and uh, top-down predictions, uh, and um, the brain is organized in many levels of processing, and the higher levels predict what is the, will be the information that will come from the lower levels. And uh, what's the, the difference of this is that uh, the lower levels will have access to information from the higher levels, not because in the exact moment when they are computing the information, they are assessing them, but because they received previous information before the critical input it received. So I argue that, Father argued that the fast speed of input system is systems is directly related with their ignorance of lots of the facts only available to central processes, and that data constraints are accomplished due to their encapsulation. Another possibility is that by having prior access to top-down information, which would satisfy the criterion for cognitive penetrability according to Pilishin, is that perceptual systems can process their domain-specific material very quickly, also due to information restriction, even without being informationally encapsulated. Uh, another question is, is the predictive penetrability of perception abductive if we consider that uh, perception is penetrable and this penetrability 
is due to predictive process? Is it abductive? Uh, according to Jakob Huvi, perceptual content is the predictions of the current best hypothesis about the world. In his view, uh, perception is not direct, but we perceive the best hypothesis that explains the sensory signal. And uh, using the predictive coding framework, we should talk about the hypothesis that best predicts the input. But there are some cases in which uh, the stimuli is ambiguous, in which two distinct scenarios could equally generate the very same inputs. And uh, the question here, is the predictive penetrability of perception abductive? I will talk, is the predictive penetrability of perception Bayesian? Because when we have uh, an ambiguous input, uh, the input is compatible with, for example, two distant hypotheses. And I call hypothesis because if you have an ambiguous input, we don't have an ambiguous perception, an ambiguous phenomenology. We perceive that hypo the hypothesis that best fits the stimulus. Uh, it's a kind of guessing. And uh, the optimal way of guessing is called Bayesian inference. For example, this is a, the T-Rex illusion. It's similar to the hollow mask illusion, but is a ambiguous stimuli. We perceive the head of the dinosaur as moving and with a convex shape. But the input we received it's also compatible with the hypothesis that it has a concave shape. That what it, it really is. Okay. Explaining the illusion with Bayesian and predictive coding terms, I talked that uh, the brain's trying to guess what is in the world and uh, he has the job to infer from the effect, from the sensory data, what is the state of the world that is causing it. He needs to infer the cause from the effect. And uh, it cannot be accomplished with using deduction because both effects are equally compatible with rival hypotheses. So to guess, if you use Bayesian inference that considers that uh, the prior is equal to the likelihood times the posterior is equal to the likelihood prior, uh, times the prior, which means the probability of the one hypothesis given the evidence, the sense data, is equal to the probability of the sense data given the hypothesis times the probability of the hypothesis. Uh, if we consider this case, we have two hypotheses and uh, the sense data is equally probable given the two hypotheses. But the prior probability of each hypothesis is different because the hypothesis one that the dinosaur head is concave, it's solid, has a greater prior probability than the hypothesis that is concave. So it will generate the hypothesis one a greater posterior than the hypothesis two. And it will wins and generates our percept or phenomenology, even in the case when the, we are misrepresenting the world, like creating this illusion. So we are not directly perceiving the world, but we are uh, perceiving the hypothesis that best predicts, best explains. And another key idea of predictive coding is that 
perception and action are integrated. Perception, we uh, alter our model of the world to fit the sensory signal. And action, we change the world to fit our model. So we, we can passively see the T-Rex and infer what is the best hypothesis that ex explains it. But we can also, using this hypothesis, try to move. And this, the two hypotheses are generating predictions that at a certain point, they are equally corroborating both hypotheses. But there is a critical instant that is a kind of experimental crucis in which hypothesis one generates one prediction and hypothesis two another prediction. And we see a prediction error when we go behind the T-Rex. This is a, just a speculation. Uh, I'm not saying that brain is implementing a Bayesian inference, but it's what normally is, is said that it's the brain approximates Bayesian inference. Uh, another kind of uh, influence of knowledge in perception is uh, using language processing. Uh, we, we did an experiment last year here at the Unicinus lab. Uh, we tried to see if two groups of individuals differing on their knowledge, uh, reading the very same sentences, could show a distinct signal that could signalize the prediction error of uh, a, a semantic violation and a lexical violation. I will Summarizing the experiment, they read sentences word by word like Fedon was written by some group was made of philosophers, other of non-philosophers. And uh, the conjecture was that we were processing the stimuli, perceptual level first, then we recognize a word, a lexical item, then we assess the meaning, And after we modulate the state of affairs being described, assess a belief relevant to what we are reading, and we predict a specific stimuli. In the semantic level, we think about Plato. At the lexical level, we respect a specific word. And at the perceptual level, we also expect a particular physical realization of a word. With, if what the subject sees is what he was expecting at many levels, uh, we don't see error signals. But if we present them, for example, instead of Plato, Kant or Schopenhauer, uh, it will generate a violation of expectancy, expectancy what we found was a semantic one and a lexical one. This is the, the result of the experiments with philosophers and not philosophers. This signal, uh, event-related potential component, N400, is a component of the ERP uh, that is sensible to semantics. And we see the difference between uh, the brain of a philosopher who knows what he was reading, if it was true or false, and a non-philosopher who was not distinguishing truth values, because for the non-philosopher, all the sentences were equally plausible. So we found that N400 effect only in the philosopher's head. But this is more a, a higher level process, is a semantic one. We also found uh, not so significant effect with uh, a more lexical processes indexed by the recognition potential at 200 milliseconds. The semantic is 400 milliseconds after the stimuli. But, yeah, but I will show other evidences that are better than this that I only discovered later, especially I will... Uh, 
está meio apertado. É. Bem? Ah, tá. Ah, beleza. Sim. I will pull some of them. Ah. Tá. That evidences of multi-level prediction in language processing. So there is a growing body of event-related potential and magnetoencephalography evidence that support the hypothesis that, that distinct brain processes underlying language comprehension can exchange information to better predict specific aspects of the upcoming stimuli. For example, Federmeyer and Kutas saw that uh, there is a preactivation of semantic features before the critical stimulus appears. For example, if we read something like the cowboy was riding with his horse or zebra, the word zebra has not a great signal of mismatch because it shares some properties with the expected stimulus. Uh, also, preactivation of word form properties when the, the critical stimuli predicted uh, was not the predicted one, but had uh, similar word form properties. Also with auditory stimuli, uh, when the subject, the context made the subject expect the word dollars and he received the word dolphins, that the first syllable, syllable, syllable guessing. Primeira sílaba é sílab. Dolphins. The first part of the word is compatible with the prediction, dollars. The N400 is delayed. So we, uh, the brain is not expecting the final, uh, the total present presentation of the word, but the first part of the word is compatible with the best prediction and the brain is the N400 has a delay. They explain this because we are predicting and not just expecting the word to appear entirely. And also the earlier lateral anterior negativity, which is more sensible, sensitive to syntactical violations, uh, according to law, uh, it involves strong structural prediction rather than integration. And the, the experiment that best fits with what we are talking about the penetrability of perception, how top-down knowledge can influence uh, the perceptual process, is this experiment from Susan Dicker, in which I would about that slide, Jamais in which she found that the M100, a component of magnetoencephalography that is generated by the visual cortex, is being modulated by semantic, syntactical, and lexical properties. So if we, the task is like, you see a banana and then appears the word banana or tomato. So we are predicting a word after a picture. And uh, the visual cortex was responding, uh, was generating an error signal when the word was not fitting, matching the picture in one of the experiments. But the question is, Previous studies strongly suggest that the visual M100 is a pre-lexical and therefore pre-semantic, pre-syntactical, low-level visual response. It occurs 100 milliseconds after the presentation of uh, stimulus. And uh, the results found are surprising because a putatively pre-lexical and also pre-semantic and pre-syntactic low-level process, process sensitivity to properties that are outside its domain of analysis. Then I ask, how can semantic, lexical, and syntactic properties 
modulate the sine wave evoked by the visual cortex if the latter only analyzes forms and physical aspects and remains blind to words, concepts, and syntax. Well, with different levels of processing, collaborating to anticipate its most likely inputs, it is possible that a perceptual process, even though it is unable to process the more abstract aspects of the superior, is aided by it by having prior access to form estimates that are translations from one format to another. This is Dicker's hypothesis. The visual cortex does not need to consult the upper levels in the exact interval in which it processes its inputs, but only make use of information previously received. So the question is that uh, the error response is being modulated by properties that are out, outside the domain of analysis of the visual cortex. Uh, one way to explain it is that the visual cortex is having prior information from higher level processes that are some kind translating in a more readable format for the visual cortex. Like if you have a, a word file that we can edit the uh, size of the letters and we want it to be readable for paint, we can convert it to another format, image format, is something that they believe uh, it's happening. So the visual cortex, uh, in the example before, will not expect the word Plato, will not think about the philosopher Plato. It's, it will expect an stimuli with a certain physical aspect. And if we present to the subject a word like Schopenhauer, it will create a violation, not because he knows the meaning, he identifies a word, but because uh, he was informed about the physical aspect of what it would receive. Uh, so the conclusion is that the central conjecture of the current review is that while sentences are read or listened, or other stimuli rather than linguistic, representation of state of affairs and events are mentally modeled in a gradual and predictive fashion, and that upcoming stimuli are anticipated based on what appears to be the most likely in epistemic, semantic, syntactical, lexical, and most important here, perceptual terms. At least when the sentential context and the prior knowledge of the reader allow it. In the light of the emergent theoretical framework, usually called predictive processing or predictive coding, uh, seminar work for Freestom, defended in the field of philosophy by Jacob Hovey and Andy Clark, assumes that brains are essentially machines that predict their next inputs with hierarchi hierarchically organized levels of processing, transmitting signals of prediction higher to lower levels, and prediction error lower to higher levels, we consider how distinct levels of processing exchange information not only in an integrative bottom-up manner, but also via downward flow of predictions. Against the passive modular approach to sensory stimuli processing, which considers input systems are informationally encapsulated and they are not affected by global processes like fodder and pillishing, we argued that higher processes give clues to lower that are, for us, cognitive penetrable processes that can help the later minimize prediction errors and thereby save energy. Each level, although possibly blind to the type of property analyzed by others, can predict, predict and process its domain-specific features of the upcoming stimulus, having prior access to information that is sometimes crucial from other levels. <laughs> Thank you for the talk and uh, for the very nice experiment that you did. I wonder if it's correct to equate um, a predictive processing model of the brain in perception and action with cognitive penetrability. So 
the worry with cognitive penetrability, the fear of cognitive penetrability was that we would um, see what we believed. The worry was that we would read into our perceptions things that we already uh, believed at the high level and that this would give us distorted information. So Fodor and others were always using cognitive impenetrability to suggest there was a level at which you could trust the information you were getting from the world because that information wasn't contaminated by theoretical um, influences by having uh, theory-laden perceptions, okay? So that was the worry and it's, it's not quite right to equate cognitive penetrability, I think, with predictive coding because predictive coding suggests you'll update your priors, that if there's a mismatch between the neutrally generated incoming signal and what you were expecting, you should get a prediction error that's sent passed up and you should revise the model. But cognitive penetrability says you don't revise perception because it's dominated by cognition. So don't you see these as intention? Well, even with the T-Rex example that is a cognitive penetrable example, uh, it's not totally penetrable because after we, we see the illusion and we know the truth, we continue seeing the illusion. So it's not, uh, I, I don't think that uh, the predictive coding would exactly uh, entail a cognitive penetrability uh, because uh, some kind of uh, encapsulation remains. But that uh, in certain cases, uh, we use information from higher levels that help the perceptual processes to process its inputs, especially when the, we cannot decide only by looking at the input, like in ambiguous cases. We'll need uh, prior knowledge to accomplish it. And, uh, but I think Gary Lupayan had an article about cognitive penetrability in the age of prediction, in which he says that wh whenever it's possible, we try to, uh, the predictive coding framework uh, is compatible with uh, penetrability. But it, it does not occur always, but only when it will help to minimize prediction error in the long run. The T-Rex example is a very special example. Remember, that's why these are illusions. That's a case where something's going wrong, where the system is stuck, just as uh, you could have binocular disparity and the system gets stuck between two hypotheses and oscillates constantly. So those are special cases, but, but normally if you want to reach precision, then you want to modify, you want to generate prediction errors so that you can continually modify. So there is pressure from the sensory level to actually change the high level, but cognitive penetrability always goes the other way around. But we can increase the importance of the sensory signal by uh, attention. Attention, I guess, for the framework, we increase the precision. Yeah, we, we give the, the cells that generate the error uh, a higher importance, gain, weight. And uh, for example, uh, the brain of uh, a schizophrenic is like the opposite. It's uh, relying too much on the predictions and less on the input. So there is a, we need a kind of equilibrium. And the context will determine if we give much, uh, um, 
more attention to our model or to the input. Like uh, if I am walking in my house at night, I don't giving too much. I'm not giving too much attention to the input, more for, uh, for the model. But uh, when is a, a new experience that I need to pay a lot of attention to the sensory signal, it's the opposite. But it can be adjusted. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I have this doubt about how to translate, for example, the Bayesian prediction, because um, if you speak about knowledge, I am always um, telling Ricardo, do you, are you sure uh, you can speak about beliefs or about knowledge? Are you sure that uh, we shouldn't uh, try to speak just about models or just about equations? So maybe, the the difference that it's made between cognitive penetrability and uh, predictive coding is related to how we use these folk psychological uh, terms so that maybe even beliefs and knowledge could be translated to equations and a kind of predictive coding computationally. Bom, eu não vou fazer nenhum comentário técnico porque eu fui parte do comitê do, do Ricardo e nós tivemos uma longa discussão com muitos detalhes técnicos. Na verdade, é, como tanto Ricardo é, como Sofia são pessoas que têm uma posição bastante assim é, humilde, circunspecta, eu queria fazer um elogio público. É, eu sou muito duro nas minhas avaliações e Acho que aqui a gente está diante de um momento histórico, né? A defesa do Ricardo em nível de mestrado, né? Deve ser notado isso, sequer é um doutorado, era um mestrado. É, inaugurou um, é, um, é um fato histórico que inaugura uma, uma forma de fazer filosofia no Brasil. É porque, assim, de repente eu e Sofia fomos ter essa experiência de fazer filosofia experimental, filosofia da neurociência na prática depois do doutorado. O Ricardo em mestrado. É, tem a oportunidade de ter a primeira defesa, a primeira dissertação com uma abordagem empírica. Isso tem um, um, um caráter histórico. Então, independente de qualquer é, questão técnica ou de qualquer diferença teórica, eu acho que a gente tem que, de alguma forma, é, enaltecer é, a competência da Sofia e do Ricardo, a coragem e ter uma abordagem dessa no Brasil. Né? porque a gente sofre muito preconceito com isso e isso é absolutamente revolucionário se essa partir de uma ideia filosófica e trazer ela para o campo de teste então isso isso tem um peso histórico e é a primeira vez que foi feito né? é, não só pela importância mas também pelo caráter inaugural né? a novidade que isso representa então acho que é, o mais importante ser notado é isso é a primeira vez que isso se faz no Brasil isso é, é, é muito importante para esse programa, para essa universidade isso deve ser visto com muito orgulho é só um, um elogio que eu queria fazer muito obrigada obrigado acho que, acho que seria isso né? é... Eu vou passar a palavra, então, ao Gabriel. Eu agradeço, Gabriel, as suas palavras. Acho que nós temos um caminho ainda árduo pela frente. Né? Eu, na verdade... Não vou falar nada. Tá bom. Não vou falar nada. É. Bom, é, não, então, é, eu... Essa apresentação, na verdade, é uma, uma, uma certa homenagem a um final de parceria. Final não, mas início de uma nova parceria né, entre nós dois, porque o Ricardo, é, em breve, vai se mudar para a Austrália né, e vai deixar aqui saudades né, do nosso grupo, Social Brains, aqui. Nós estamos nos últimos meses aqui eh, mudando, então, a, a nossa estrutura dentro do laboratório. Eh, e o Ricardo está se preparando para assumir uma bolsa australiana, né, que ele recebeu da Universidade de Monash, eh, na Austrália, a quarta melhor universidade australiana. 
60 melhor universidade do mundo, né? e ele foi é, agraciado com uma bolsa integral de doutorado. Então, nós estamos muito felizes né, de ter um aluno nosso tendo esse reconhecimento mundial, e nós estamos nos preparando, então, para reorganizar o nosso laboratório com mentes novas, mentes ainda sociais novas. Né? E o Ricardo sempre vai ser um colaborador. Né? Então, é um momento especial esse aqui, então, de é, homenagem, a, digamos, a, ao nosso trabalho conjunto e de expectativa né, do que virá para frente. Tá?